So, um, just to review the cerebrum, uh, you got the surface feature, you got four lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal. The insula is deep to the lateral cerebral fissure, well, the lateral fissure. Um, you can't see it from the outside, you have to pull that lateral fissure apart to see the insula inside. The gy gyrus and the sulcus, uh, the central sulcus, and then they have precentral gyrus and postcentral gyrus. We're going to get into those here in a minute about what those, how important those are. And um, then we have um, lateral sulcus, that's the deep groove separating the frontal and temporal lobes. The parietal occipital sulcus separates the parietal and occipital lobes. And then there's a longitudinal fissure with a deep groove right down the middle of the brain. There's also a transverse fissure, which actually is the deep groove that separates the cerebellum from the rest of the rest of the brain. So there's a deep groove back there. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to see that in one of the pictures. Next slide. So, so here we go. This is uh, we're getting. We're, I'm getting into uh, talking about. I know this looks repetitive. I'm getting into talking about functional areas of the brain. I just want to make sure that we're on the same page and show where everything is. So I'm showing you the central sulcus, the frontal lobe that uh, divides the front central sulcus dividing the front, frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. Then you have the parietal, parieto occipital sulcus, which separates the occipital lobe from the parietal lobe. And then you have the temporal lobe and you have the lateral fissure down there. So that's the lateral fissure here. Okay. And we have the central sulcus going down through here. We have a, a parietal occipital sulcus here. And you can see it actually on the medial side very easily. So uh, let's see. So you have the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. And if you pull apart this, use the retractors, then you can pull that apart, pull those apart, and you can see the insula underneath. Okay. All right. Next slide. So what I want to point out in this one really is I'll point out all those other things. Here's your uh, well, here's your insula. It's here. Uh, your frontal lobe your temporal lobe, your parietal lobe is blue, and your occipital lobe is back here in green. So the sulcus that divides the parietal and occipital lobe is there, and the um, transverse fissure is here. So that's this fissure. So the, the, cere the cerebellum is sitting here, it's kind, of, it's kind of a cauliflower sitting back here, and the brains is over here on the on the I can't put my hand that way. So, there, so the base the base of the occipital lobe is, is like here back behind it, but there's a, a big gap. Um, well, they're, they're sitting next to each other, but there's you can pull them apart very easily and see a gap between the two of them. So they aren't connected; they are actually separated. The cerebrum and the cerebellum are cerebrum. That's called the transverse fissure in back. Then, um, so we have the central sulcus, the precentral gyrus. I mentioned that before, and the postcentral gyrus. So we're going to get into the, what, what those are here shortly. Next slide. Um, let's see. Going back over um, the cerebrum one more time. Here's the uh, insula lobe. And the temporal lobe has been cut there. And you can see the transverse fissure is down here. So that's what this uh, large space is down back down here, the transverse fissure. That's uh, different from the lateral fissure, which is the temporal lobe and parietal lobe fissure. And um, let's see. And then here's your central sulcus here. And your postcentral gyrus. And your precentral gyrus there. So I'll draw. So there's your central sulcus. Okay. Just to get our orientations to everything. So I'll show you the transverse fissure and the insula. And I'll just note a picture of it. Okay. Next slide. So the um, so some parts of the um, brain, the um, uh, functions of the, of the brain, uh, we have the one of the big divisions is this uh, is this central sulcus going along through here. Okay. So this is the postcentral gyrus and the precentral. This is the precentral gyrus. And this is the postcentral gyrus. Gyrus. And this is the precentral gyrus. Okay. 
And then we have an area down here, and this is all the temporal lobe here. Okay, just a different view of the brain, just to show you some, uh, a couple different things, just see what it looks like in different dissected brains. So, next slide. Okay, so the functional areas of the cerebral cortex, you have sensory, motor, and association areas. Associ association areas are what you use to do complex uh, integration of uh, sensory um, information, and then you, uh, and you, the neurons talk about it back and forth between themselves, like I mentioned earlier, and then you send information back out to motor neurons to do whatever you need to, you've decided to do. So the majority of the cortex, uh, the, the gray matter, the cerebral cortex, is association areas. Um, and you um, receive and send the information back and forth between the areas of cortex via the association fibers. So those are fibers that go back and forth within a hemisphere. So that's association fibers. So the sensory areas, you have a primary somatosensory area, a primary auditory area, a primary so primary somatosensory area. So somato meaning body, sensory meaning, so it's uh, sensory from the body. And that's located in the post-central gyrus, okay? And that uh, receives nerve impulses for touch, uh, proprioception, pain, and temperature. Then you have the primary auditory area that's in the temporal lobe, as you expect, it's down on the sides, next to your ears. And then you have uh, the gustatory area. There's your, uh, in the post-central gyrus. And you'll have the olfactory area for smell. So gustatory is taste. So that's taste. And olfactory smell. And visual is the occipital lobe. So next slide. Motor areas. You have a primary motor area. And that's in the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe and initiates impulses to skeletal muscles, and you have something else called uh, Broca's speech area, and that's a motor area that, uh, that allows you to um, uh, talk. So it, it uh, helps your, so that uh, you decide what you want to say, and then the nerve impulses go down to like what I'm doing now, and uh, initiates, um, you know, the shape of your mouth and what your tongue is doing and the flow of air across your vocal cords and, and where the vocal cords are are um, contracted or relaxed, and so it gives, you know, give, and also so you can produce volume and produce uh, pitch in your voice, so all those kind of things. Then you have association areas. We're only going to talk about a couple of those. Vernica's area, which is usually in the left temporal lobe and, and parietal, uh, so you recognize words, you translate those words into thoughts, and probably and possibly helps sound out words and sounds. And you have uh, the somatic Somatosensory, visual, and auditory association areas, those are areas that are adjacent to the primary cortex, which means that signals come into the cortex and then it goes out to, it goes side, sideways to the association areas, which then think about what it, what it is, and then they, those areas then send information to a motor area to do something with that information. So information comes in, is received by a, an area, which sends it over to another area, a larger area, to talk about it and think about it, and then um, those neurons talk about it back and forth with the nerve impulses, and then they send information over to a motor area, which then sends information down to the uh, skeletal muscles. Okay. Um, so you can identify objects by touch or identify sound as speech or music. So you can do all those kind of things. All right, next slide. So this is the uh, surface view of the cerebrum, and we're going to look at uh, various parts of the of the cerebral cortex and talk about what those parts do. So this uh, landmark here is your central sulcus. And so then we have your post central gyrus. And the red is your pre central gyrus. So the post-central gyrus is your primary somatosensory cortex, uh, also referred to as S1. And so somatosensory means somato meaning body, sensory meaning uh, sensory uh, information coming into there from the body. So temperature, pain, um, what your fingers are doing, what your fingers are touching, um, where your body parts are, those kind of things. So you have um, 
you have this area that receives, this blue area receives the um, uh, information from various body parts. Then it will, uh, but it doesn't decide what to do entirely. It sends information over to this S2 area, so the somatosensory association cortex. And that area is which neurons that are associating with each other and talking back and forth and tons and tons of neurons doing this and deciding what to do with the information that you received from the, uh, from the sensory information that's coming. And the sensory information came from those, remember, those projection fibers coming up, uh, crossing over and going, uh, going up into the left and right hemispheres of the, blind, of the brain, and they come up into this somatosensory area. So you have the somatosensory association cortex, which then decides what to do with that information. In the back, you have a primary visual cortex in the occ occipital lobe back there. And so you have um, the uh, information you receive from the eye goes back on sensory neurons, back to the back of your brain, back to the visual cortex back there. And you have, um, so you have the somatosensory association cortex here, and you have a visual association cortex down here. So information... The, uh, sen the sensory information from, the, from your eyes goes into this association area. Then you also have an auditory association or a so auditory cortex, where that's a primary area where uh, and that's right next to your ears. So, so you have hearing uh, goes right in there and into that, that, that area. And then it will go into its association area, which is the auditory association cortex. And then we have this other this uh, other region, the parietal association cortex, that uh, takes care of lots of other um, uh, association functions to do with um, to do with uh, uh, sensory information. The back half of the brain basically is all pretty much all involved in sensory, okay, and figuring out what to do with that sensory information. Um, there's another area here, this dotted uh, area called Wernicke's area. And that Wernicke's area is um, is a, an area revolved in uh, understanding speech, so language, uh, so you're hearing things, you're um, seeing uh, the mouth move, all those kind of things. All that information is all put together in Wernicke's area uh, to decide what to do and to understand what someone is saying uh, to you. So this is all the sensory part is all in, in the back part, and you have the temporal association area. And there's also the smell um, and the olfactory and the gustatory, the, the taste areas are like underneath underneath this uh, temporal association area here. Then we have the frontal area, and this frontal area is a lot of motor functions here, um, as well as, well, I should say, this part here is motor, and this part here, so this is motor, and this part here is intellect. So this front part here, the prefrontal cortex, uh, is a lot, this is a lot of um, intellect and personality and association uh, areas, they're all there. Um, you you have the precentral gyrus, the red area up here, and so that's your, that's the area where signals start start uh, to be sent down to the body to control skeletal muscles. So what happens is you have information coming to the, to the blue area, the somatosensory cortex, and say it goes over to the somatosensory uh, area. You also have visual information coming from the primary cortex, and it goes over into the uh, visual association area. And then you have that information will, will then go into this association area, and it kind of decides what to do. And then you can send information over to this uh, brown area up in front, this premotor cortex, which then decides what to do with all that information. It's like, okay, I've received all the sensory information, and this sensory information is uh, the association area is over on the back side of our brain. Said, oh, this guy's this person speaking to you, and or this or someone's running towards you with a knife or whatever, and you take that information, and you say, oh. I need to do something with that. So which neurons do I need to fire? And then it sends information over to the precentral gyrus, the primary motor cortex, which sends information down to the skeletal muscles to, say, take off running because there's somebody running towards you with a knife or a lion coming towards you, or um, or you see you're reading words on a page and you want to write them down. So you read, the, read these words and you say, oh, I want to write these down. So then you have information. Go to your fingers to write down the words. So uh, there's one other area that's uh, that's in uh, also in, in dotted 
areas I wanted to point out too, called Broca's area. And he's involved in speech. So you have Wernicke's area is understanding, is understanding speech. So that's understanding. You've heard the words, and then that's for understanding speech. And then you have Broca's area, which is for um, which is for uh, making or creating making speech. So so you have you understand it back here, and then you have a little area in front that. Um, in which you uh, control the muscles that control the, the tongue and the mouth and the uh, vocal vocal folds and uh, air going across across the vocal folds so that you can increase volume or uh, increase pitch take it take pitch up take pitch down you can sing all those kind of things so what I'm doing right now I'm talking so I have um, Broca's areas work is working real hard and we know that these areas exist because of I think I mentioned earlier because of like uh, strokes or damage to the brain that, that occurred that damaged these various areas okay the next few slides are I'm, I'm gonna go through the same kind of kind of things as well and talk about some of these specific areas uh, next slide so here's uh, the parietal lobe uh, we're talking about uh, back here we have uh, Wernicke's area, they drew it slightly higher than we had on the other diagram. Um, so we're looking at uh, a slightly smaller, I should say. So it should, I, I would think it'd be a little bit, little bit larger than that. But anyway, that's Wernicke's area. Occipital lobe for vis vision. Parietal, parietal lobe for spatial awareness, uh, manip manipulating objects, spelling, all that kind of stuff. So that's your parietal association area. So you have your central sulcus here. Central sulcus here. You have your uh, postcentral central gyrus there, and your pre-central gyrus here. Just give you your uh, so that postcentral gyrus is your somatosensory um, area, and the precentral gyrus is your uh, primary motor area, just to remind you of those things. So you have Wernicke's area, you have your vision, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, uh, memory, uh, remembering faces and emotions, and those kind of things. Uh, frontal lobe is planning and organizing really higher level skills, emotional and behavioral control, uh, personality, problem solving, attention, social skills, all that stuff. Broca's area is expressing language, it's creating language, while Wernicke's area is for understanding language. Okay, next slide. So here's just another diagram, a little bit simpler diagram of the functional areas of the cerebral cortex. So we have the the precentral gyrus, precentral gyrus. We have the post central gyrus for the somatosensory area, visual area back here. So we have the sorry primary motor area, primary somatosensory area, the primary visual area. The Wernicke's is a dotted line, primary uh, auditory area, and then uh, primary so the association area for uh, auditory uh, functions. Broca's speech area down uh, down here, and primary gustatory area is down is down here underneath. So uh, next slide. Here's a, a simplified diagram. You have uh, your auditory area, so you hear things comes in from the auditory area. You see a little arrow go over to the lighter green, so it goes into Wernicke's area, which helps you understand what's what's being said. And then the information is relayed to Broca's area to respond back. So I'm hearing somebody speak, and they're saying, "Hey, Scott, how you doing?" And then I I understand that I understand so because I understand English, I understand language. If they said it, if they said something in French, I might understand it. If they say it in Chinese, I will have no idea what they're saying. So it depends. You know, I I, I don't. I don't know. I know English well. I know French a little bit. I know Spanish a little, little tiny bit. So it depends. You know. So you understand language, and so then you send that information to your, um, to Broca's area to create the speech, and then Broca's area then sends information to the motor area to actually move the, the muscles. So that's how the flow of, of these nerve impulses go. Okay. Next slide. Here's a little bit more complicated uh, version of it. So you have a primary somatosensory area here and so you have sensation come from the body and that's going into this association cortex in the somatic in the parietal lobe you also have primary visual cortex you have information coming into that association area association area and you have auditory information all coming into 
So it comes into here, comes in here, and here from the somatosensory, from the auditory, and from the visual. And so you put all that together, and then in Bernica's area, you have taken all that information together, so you, I see somebody speak, I see their mouth move, I see their body language, and I can interpret things from that. I also feel, um, I feel maybe their breath, I feel vibrations, I feel things like that, I feel temperature, and I put all that information together. Someone's close to me, someone's farther away from me, and I, and I take all that information, as well, all the visual stuff, as well as the feeling, temperature, vibrations, uh, where my hands are, where I am spatially uh, in relation to them, as well as hearing them, and all that information, then it gets processed, and I understand it through Wernicke's area, and then that sends signal over to Broca's area, which then uh, then I can respond back to it. So, so somebody says, hi, Scott, but I, I can tell they're, say, 10 feet away versus one foot away. And I can I don't feel heat from them, so I know they're not close. And all those that information comes together. And then that sends information over to the primary motor cortex, which then makes me respond back, say, say hey, Sue, or whoever it is. So that's how all this works. All right, next slide. Okay, one of the things I uh, meant to mention on the previous slide is about Broca's area, um, making speech. So um, there, there are examples, like, and here's an example of a, of a stroke. You, um, a, there, is a, um, there are documented examples of a person who's had a stroke. It was a small stroke. It affected Broca's uh, speech area. So, he, so the, the guy wasn't able to, uh, to make speech. He was able to make like a couple, some sounds, uh, make a couple of sounds. But it only affected, his stroke was only on his left side. So he went to um, occupational therapy, and uh, and they taught him the right side of your brain in that same area is really uh, more for singing. So what they did was they he could not make a sound. His his wife would ask him a question, and he could only respond back basically with one word. That's the only thing he could like make a sound for. So what they did was they went back they went back and taught him in physical therapy and occupational therapy to use the right side of your brain. The right side of that area on the right side of your brain is really more for um, singing, okay? So, so what they did was they taught him to, he could still understand what, pe what people were saying, he just couldn't form the words. So they taught him to sing back to his wife. And so he was able to sing back to his wife and eventually they taught him to be able to speak rather than sing everything back to her. So, so you can, uh, so that's why you know, occupational therapy, physical therapy is very important because the doc will come in and say, well, you know, this is what happened and there's no surgery we can do to fix it, but you know, we're going to send you to physical therapy, occupational therapy, and they can teach you how to redo uh, the things that you should be doing. So you'll be, you would be spending, uh, so all of you using the PTA programs, OTA programs, will be spending uh, a lot of time uh, with people, and it could be months that you're, that you're working with someone who, say, has had a stroke. Uh, or has had uh, various uh, types of brain injury, say a car accident or something like that. So um, anyway, so that's Broca's speech area and a uh, uh, little sideline on that. So hemispheric lateralization. So everybody's heard about left brain, light, right brain, right, left brain, light, right brain. And so most people are left brain dominant. You are 90% um, of people are dominant. The left brain, which is uh, reading, writing, math, decision making, speech, and language is mostly in that hemisphere. And the, uh, the right side has um, touch, smell, sight, taste, recognition, uh, voices, uh, voice inflections. If you have unclear dominance between the right and the left, uh, sometimes you'll have dyslexia. Um, and those uh, is generally associated with uh, unclear, do unclear dominance between those two areas. So um, anyway, and you can see some in this, in this uh, diagram down here, you have the left brain has general interpretive center, language, and math. Where on the right, you have a lot of spatial visualization and analysis. And uh, you also have analysis by touch is in the right side versus uh, writing is, is more on the, on the left side of the brain. So so there's, so there's not only do you have different areas in, in the hemispheres that do certain things, uh, you'll notice that you have an auditory co cortex in the left ear and an auditory cortex in the right ear. So both of those have... Uh, and you also have a visual cortex in the right, in the left and right side. So um, it's actually the, the right side of the brain, but the left visual field. And the right side of the brain has the left ear. So, so those go across the corpus callosum, which is those commissural fibers that go back and forth.
So, okay. Um, let's see anything else there. Um, so yeah, so you have left brain, right, right brain, right brain, and the left brain is dominant. All right, next slide. Okay, we talk about where do you know where do these kind of weird names come <clears throat> come from the diencephalon. So <clears throat> you actually have these are actually from <clears throat> um, embryology. You have what's called the telencephalon, the metencephalon, uh, the diencephalon, and the mesencephalon, and then the myela encephalon. So that's what all these different different words come from. The telencephalon is cerebrum. The metencephalon is the cerebellum. The diencephalon, <clears throat> the thalamus and hypothalamus. The mesencephalon is the midbrain, just below the diencephalon, and the uh, medulla oblongata is the myela encephalon. So, just to let you know where those those actually um, words come from, they are from oh the metencephalon. Sorry, I missed that was the pons. So. Um, <clears throat> Those words come from embryology, from the different, uh, there's different bulges. There, you have this, the neural tube I showed you in the beginning, and you start having these bulges occur in each section. And so you have the, um, the myelencephalon, the mesencephalon, the metencephalon, the diencephalon, the metencephalon, sorry, the uh, telencephalon at top. So, all right, next slide. So, uh, oh, encephalography. Um, more correctly, electroencephalography, EEG, detecting or brain waves is what you're being detected. Electric pulses. So, like electric pulses, the brain, where do they come from? Well, neurons, they're firing these action potentials down the axons. And so you have these, uh, these uh, electrical uh, charges that you can detect in the brain as, as those, those uh, charges travel down the nerve, nerve fiber. There's four types of brain waves you can detect. There's alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves so you have alpha waves you have beta waves theta waves and delta waves delta you're uh, you're sleepy you're sleeping you have you're dreaming okay you're deep in sleep theta you're um you're drowsy you're daydreaming uh maybe driving uh and you can't remember like you don't really remember driving the last minute or two you know you were thinking about something all of a sudden you're like huh you know you're sort of on automatic your visual you're visually processing things as you're going by, so you kept the car on the road, but you just kind of sort of forgot where you were uh, on the road. So that, so you were actually uh, maybe in, in theta, probably in theta there. Uh, alpha, you're relaxed, but you're alert. You're not aroused, but you're thinking about things, maybe reflecting, uh, but you're, and you're you're just relaxed. You're you know sitting back in your easy chair, you're just kind of thinking about things. Beta waves, you're highly alert, focused, aroused, working, you're talking. So I'm in beta right now. So and uh, probably a number of you have gone drifted off from theta into delta multiple times while I've been talking because it is now close to two hours on this thing. So anyway, hopefully you're wa watching this in chunks. <laughs> so, but if we were in class, I would still be talking for, for two hours. So maybe the online class isn't so bad. I don't know, whatever. Um, so anyway, the waves differ in their frequencies in different areas of the brain. So, uh, and you can use these for diagnosing different things like uh, coma, brain disease, uh, epilepsy, dementia, and so you can decide if someone's brain dead or not. That's how you, you do it. You just, you look at it, electroencephalograms, electroencephalograms, and look and see if there's brain wave activity. And these, these are what the brain waves are, these, these activities. And uh, they're in these different frequencies. And so you have and a frequency, Hertz is a frequency. Hertz is one cycle. So, and this is a cycle, it's a sine wave. So that's one hertz, okay? And um, so you have, uh, and those are, uh, it's a cycle per second, so one hertz. So you have 18 to 14 cycles, so this would be, so that is one cycle, and that is one second. Okay, oops, that's a terrible E, so sorry about that, one second. Um, so you can, and you see they have different, uh, different frequencies. So frequency is how many cycles you have in a certain period of time. So, so, have, if, so alpha, alpha waves, you would have eight, uh, eight of these sine waves in one second, eight to 14 uh, cycles, cycles per second. So, or Hertz, uh, Delta, you'd be one half to four cycles per second or Hertz. Um, anyway, um, so, and you also use these to measure brain activity during general anesthesia. 
So if you so when you go when you're trying to go to sleep, you can put the book down and close your eyes. You can go from beta, where you're where you're actually alert and you're reading things, uh, to alpha, where you're relaxed and you're you're reading things. And then you start drifting off into theta, and then all of a sudden you're in delta, and you put the put the book down. And then you wake up. You might and your alarm goes off. You might go into beta. But then you hit snooze and you go back into and you can go right back into theta or even delta real fast. And so I know I've done that, you know, and it's nine minutes on the snooze button. So you hit it and nine minutes later, it goes off again. So, but in brainwave state, you define it by the dominant brainwave that's present. You have all the brainwaves are, are all present at all times. Just some, some, they're usually, there's one that's dominant and the rest are, the rest are present in lesser amounts. So, okay, next slide. So here's some examples of brain waves. So we have alpha, the alpha, alpha waves, you can see their uh, frequency uh, is the beta waves are the highest frequency, you have the highest number of those, so you have lots of lots of, of those. I'll try to draw them as, as like that. Alpha waves are a little bit less. So here's your here's your graph, here's your graph of those. And theta, this isn't the best aren't the best graphs, graphs. So these these are a little bit longer. And then delta. Are your long waves here okay so that gives you kind of a uh, so this is your most erratic this is most alert this is uh, uh, your thinking so you're awake but and this is daydream and this would be sleeping so okay next slide okay so we have the brain. We described all the a lot of the, all the features of the brain, and so what else do we need to talk about? We're talking about the protection of the brain. The cranial bones are one of the ways that we pr protect the brain. They surround the brain, so we have the cranium here, and so it's all the way around the brain. Okay, face, the face, and the, and the, the frontal bone, parietal bone, temporal bone, occipital bone, all holding that in. You also have fossa. So yeah, there's anterior anterior fossa, the middle, and the posterior cranial fossa. So where the brain sits in, in all of those. And we talked about those when we talked about the skull. Next slide. So here's the fossa. You have the frontal lobes are sitting in the anterior cranial fossa. Temporal lobes are in the middle, middle one. And the occipital lobes are and or so the cerebellum actually sitting back in the posterior cranial fossa back there. So you can see here's the cerebellum back here. Cerebellum is there. And then we have the you know, temporal lobe sitting here in the middle cranial fossa. And the anterior cranial fossa has the frontal lobe up there. So we have, okay, the fossa is a depression, as you recall from the skull. So the cranial bones, um, just describing those again, this is a different picture of the same thing. So um, it's the eight cranial bones, um, and you have the um, occipital bone holding on to the cerebellum. And then you have the two uh, middle and frontal and uh, anterior cranial fossa there. Okay, next slide. Then, um, so between the brain, so you have the brain and then you have the bone outside, but you don't want the brain slamming against the, the bone. So you have coverings around the brain, okay? And those coverings are called um, dura mater, okay? And there's arachnoid mater, and there's pia mater. And mater means mother in Latin. So the dura mater is the tough, tough mother. The arachnoid mater is the uh, spider web mother. And the pia mater is the um, the gentle or loving mother. The pia mater surrounds the brain and like wraps around, goes around all the gyri and goes into the sul sulci and just hugs the whole brain. Okay, it's very closely associated with with the, the with the entire brain. The arachnoid mater is uh, between the pia mater and the dura mater. So the arachnoid mater is in the middle. It's deep to the dura mater and uh, superficial to the pia mater. And the dura mater is on the outside. It's exterior. It's the most superficial. It's deep to the cranial bones, but superficial to the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. 
the periosteal layer. So the um, uh, so the dura mater deep to the cranial bones, and there's two layers of it. There is a periosteal layer and a men meningeal layer. So periosteal layer is tough. It's attached to the cranial bones, and if you if we, if we were in a lab, uh, we'd have sheep brains, and you could actually feel the dura mater and feel how tough that is and how hard that is. To, it's really hard to tear. Um, the meningeal layer is exterior to the arachnoid mater. Uh, sorry, there's an extra R there. I need to correct that on the slide, so scratch that out. So <laughs> exterior to the arachnoid mater. The two dural layers are split. They're separated um, to form what are called the dural sinuses. Okay, the, Those drain blood into the jugular veins. So um, the superior sagittal si sinus is superior to the longitudinal, longitudinal fissure. So you remember the brain is like here, like that. So that's the longitudinal fissure here. So there's a, a sinus. Sinus is a kind of opening. So there's a little sinus right there. Um, and it's one of the main dural sinuses. Then the two layers, the dura mater, extend deep into the fissures. It goes, it actually goes, so the dura mater is on the outside here, and it goes deep into that fissure. And so hold and hold holds on. And it actually goes all the way down. It's called the, the Fox uh, cerebri as the, uh, as the dura mater that goes down in longitudinal fissure. And there's a, uh, you don't have to know these names, I'm just giving you to the tentorum uh, cerebelli. It goes into the transverse fissure, which is between the cerebellum and the, uh, and the cerebrum. And then the Fox cerebelli goes between the cerebellar, the cell, two hemispheres of the, cell, cell, of the cerebellum. So then the arachnoid mater is arachnoid villi that project into the dural sinuses. So uh, you have these dural layers that, that have the dural sinus. So the sinus is this opening, and there's arachnoid villi, so these little finger-like projections that project into the dural sinuses. And so this is, this is going to become important when we're talking about cerebral spinal fluid. And there's a space between the arachnoid mater and pia mater. So we have the, so we have the brain. I'll see if I can draw a little brain here. It's terrible. So uh, I'm going to go with different colors. So I'll go with a, a dark red. So this will be the pia mater. It's all around the outside and here. And then we have, we'll go with uh, green, will be the arachnoid mater. So it's kind of a web, webbing kind of stuff. This goes all the way around. And then I'll do the blue for, for the dura mater. So the dura mater goes all the way around, and so it all dives down in there into the longitudinal fissure. And remember, the dura mater is made of two uh, made of two layers. So I'll get back my black pen. Okay. So next slide. All right. The uh, so here's a, some diagrams showing um, how this is all put together. So let's look at the the um, well. Let's look at the top left. So we have the, the skull. You can see the skull bone here. So you have spongy bone uh, in there, and we have the cortical bone around on the outside, outside of it. The Fox cerebri, that's the dura mater that's projecting down in here. And then we have a dura, uh, dural sinus down in here, and a dural sinus up here. So this is called the superior sagittal sinus up on top. There's a dural sinus down, down in there. Then you have the dura mater, so you have a periosteal and meningeal dura. So it's two layers, so there's a periosteal is there, and the uh, meningeal is there. Then we have arachnoid mater is here, and then we have the pia mater is this fine stuff there underneath. Then the, you have a whole bunch of blood vessels going around, uh, going around the, the brain associated with the pia mater. Then we have the, uh, so going all the way around the top, uh, Right down the middle, you have the um, the longitudinal uh, fissure in the middle, and you have this uh, you have this these sinuses. So there's a sinus that goes all the way around the top here. There's also sinuses that go around here, and there's one here. So it all kind of connects. Um, and then this is the Fox cerebri, is that uh, dura mater that sticks down between the two hemispheres of the brain. So, so it, it goes down to the like the um, corpus callosum, which goes across. Um, let's see. Then I'm going to skip and then go down to the bottom here. So we see they have skull with cortical bones, spongy bone, more cor cortical bone there, and we have the 
Dura Mater there. Periosteal dura, so periosteal meaning neck, peri, uh, and osteo, osteol meaning next to the bone. Meningeal, so it's referring to the meninges, the coverings of the brain. And then we have a space underneath the dura called the subdural space, and that's where some, uh, so we got some fluid flowing in there. And then we have the arachnoid mater, and we have subarachnoid space, and then we have the pia mater. So the pia mater is closely associated with the brain, and the arach arachnoid mater has these, uh, if you can see in there, has like all these little, there's like little webbing, uh, little fine webbing there. So, And then we also have some, uh, inside here we have some blood vessels scattered in amongst the arachnoid mater. So between the pia mater and the arach and actually within the arachnoid mater and the, uh, in, in the that subarachnoid space. And um, then we also have uh, the sinuses. So we have a dural sinus down here and a superior sagittal sinus here. And then we have these arachnoid villi here. So we have these, these little villas. It's a finger, so it's like little fingers sticking up in here. So you have cerebral spinal fluid. Um, you have excess fluid is able to flow through these and out in the sinus so that they, it can flow then out and get out of the brain. So otherwise, you'd have fluid accumulation in the brain nowhere for it to go. So you need for these arachnoid villi to stick out into these dural sinuses to uh, release fluid in, into them so it can get so it can uh, drain off the brain. And then that drains into the jugular veins and then that fluid drains drains out from there. So uh, next slide. Okay, so we have, uh, so here's a close up of a cadaver brain showing the uh, uh, cranial meninges. So here's, um, here's your Fox cerebri here, this, uh, port, this vertical piece sitting down here, Sp superior sagittal sinus is this hole here in the middle. Uh, this was skin on top. There's your parietal bone of the cranium. So dura mater, you can notice it's closely associated with the, with the bone. Then we have arachnoid mater. You can see it's kind of uh, it's, it's webbing there. And then we have the subarachnoid space. So we have space that's actually in uh, all, all in here. And then we have the, uh, the pia mater, which is, uh, which is very closely associated with with the um, very closely associated, sorry, with with the surface of the brain. So this would be the pia mater down here, and a little bit of it actually pulled up here, this part here, and then this is all cerebral cortex here, here. So this is gray matter, this is gray, and this is white there. So that's white and gray there, and gray matter and white matter here. So, okay, next slide. So, so here's a, a view of the dural sinus up here, um, a super, or superior sagittal sinus uh, up here, superior sagittal sinus. You have the arachnoid villi, uh, sticking into the superior sagittal sinus, so you have uh, drainage of fluid off the brain, and then you have, um, you know, white matter here, and uh, cerebral cortex is this stuff here. The Fox cerebri is this here, central stuff, and subarachnoid space, this all in there, and the pia mater, is all right there. Let's see if I can stop. So this would be the and the dura mater is all here. So and this is bone here. It's bone. So I think that's that's pretty much it. So yeah. So um, and the arachnoid mater. Um, is the layer right underneath the uh, meningeal layer. So it's that purplish kind of layer right there. So, okay. Um, all right. I think that's, that's pretty much for, for the meninges. So you have three layers. You have the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia mater. The dura mater is divided into two pieces, uh, two layers, periosteal layer, meningeal layer. Uh, the arachnoid mater has uh, little villi that stick up into the sagittal sinus. 
The pia mater is, is the loving mother and it, it hugs the brain. So the dura mater is the tough mother on the outside and the um, and they have blood vessels that are going through what's called the subarachnoid space. So there's lots of space in there, so we have blood vessels going around there. And you can drain the fluid off through those arachnoid villi into the, into the sinuses, the superior sagittal sinus. Okay, next slide. So, okay, now we're going to talk about uh, you have holes in your brain. Uh, they were called ventricles. So here's our um, here's all the pieces that you uh, pretty pretty much know now. We have the central sulcus, parietal lobe, the parietal occipital sulcus, diencephalon with thalamus, epithalamus, and hypothalamus. So there's the thalamus. Oops, here's the thalamus. Here's the hypothalamus. Here. Here's the epithalamus here. And then we have the uh, pineal gland sticking off the back. So the pineal gland. So thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus with, with and the epithalamus with the pineal gland. Uh, we have our occipital lobe. We have the um, brain stem. And we're looking at the midbrain area here, midbrain. The pons, so the midbrain pons and the medulla oblongata down here, okay? So, and, and that also. Then we have the cerebellum back there. Let me erase one of these lines here, so. All right, so. Because I want to show some stuff, and I'm gonna, so that's what else. Uh, oh, the frontal lobe up there, and the corpus callosum and the fornix. Those are things that you that you guys will need to know, and the temporal lobe. So you need to know all those, all those parts. Um, now we're going to talk about the ventricles of the brain. So um, I'm going to erase all all this all this stuff and start start back over. So we so you can see things in here. Okay, get my pen back. All right. So we have ventricles of the brain here, and this is a you notice this is a depression that goes back in there. So there's that. And then there's also a, an area here around the thalamus, here, going here, and up around, back to there, and then coming forward, and then going down here. There's this little tube coming down here, and then it widens as you get next to the cerebellum here. And then it continues on and actually goes into and becomes uh, feeds down into when you get down here into the spinal cord it becomes what's called the central canal of the spinal cord so this well that was too big sorry that was your thalamus let me take that back out again so so what we're going to do is there's actually the intermediate mass of the thalamus is right about here. Okay, so we have what are called this upper part, the most superior part is called the lateral ventricle. This middle part where the thalamus is, this is called, is it labeled on here? I don't see it. This is called the third ventricle. This little tube that comes down, down through here is called the cerebral aqueduct. And then this triangular part that's right in front of the, of the cerebellum here is called the fourth ventricle. Okay? So, so there are, there's, there's your pieces. So the intermediate mass of the, of, the thalamus, of the thalamus is this little circle that I drew right here. And you're going to see that uh, when we look at a model of what the, um, what the ventricles look like. Okay. So we have... There's, and there's two lateral ventricles. There's one on the right side, one on the left side. On, uh, and then there's there's third ventricle, which is between the two thalami. And then you have a cerebral aqueduct that comes down and opens up into a space in front of the cerebellum, and then it continues down in the spinal cord. So, okay, next slide. So, so here's what the ventricles look like. So you have the lateral ventricle, ventricles. So you have two of them. Then you have the third ventricle. You have a cerebral, which is this guy here. Okay, and then you have what's called the cerebral aqueduct here. Then you widen out into the fourth ventricle. Show you that, and then you go down. It feeds into 
the central canal, which goes out to the spinal cord. Okay. Then you have what connects the lateral ventricles, and they go from here, and there's a posterior horn and an anterior uh, inferior horn, so that they follow that whole shape. And there's also this piece right here that feeds in between. Uh, so it looks, it's kind of like the Starship Enterprise. You have this, you have these um, two pins. Yeah. So you have the, the Starship Enterprise. If you see, if you've seen that, you know, you got that, and then you've got your, um, you, know, you have a um, interventricular. Uh, the interventricular foramen, which is two two uh, tubes that come come together and go down into the third ventricle. So it's sort of like it's kind of like the, uh, the the warp drive engines on the back of the, of the Starship Enterprise. And I should actually stick a picture of that in <laughs> in this slide. That would be actually fun. So anyway, all right, next slide. So this is a plastic cast of the ventricles. Uh, they actually did put plastic into the ventricles, and it fills up the spaces, and then let it harden, and then take the uh, take the brain out from around it, and this is what you get. So you have a um, right the right lateral ventricle is here, and then we have um, the inter interverticular foramen going from the lateral ventricle. So this is the right lateral ventricle here. I'm going to go and. So it's the uh, posterior horn, superior, anterior, and this is the inferior horn, and this is the posterior horn of the other lateral ventricle back here. I'm just going to color it in. This is your third ventricle here. I look like a bird, yes. And here's your interverticular foramen coming down to it. So you have your interverticular foramen, the third ventricle. And then come down from it, you have the cerebral aqueduct come down from it, and it goes into, and you have the fourth ventricle down here. So fourth ventricle down there. So, so you have, uh, you have, sorry, you have left and right uh, lateral ventricles, then you have the third ventricle, one of those right with thalamus on either side, and that hole that's right in the middle there, this the eye of the bird here. That is where the intermediate mass of the thalamus, or the thalami, goes. So you have these two thalami, and you have this little bridge right across between them. So the third ventricle is right between those with that little hole there. And then you have the cerebral aqueduct coming down, and then you have the, uh, the fourth ventricle in front of the, of the cerebellum down there. So, And I've got a little video that you guys can watch. Uh, there's a guy who talks about it and goes, it's like uh, it's four, four or five minutes long, where he, he shows this model. I would have loved to have done that in class. You, we have these these models in class. And I would show you these guys in class if we were there. So, but I did not do a video of those myself. I don't think so. Uh, but I'll, I'll post one, a YouTube video on those YouTube video of those so you can you guys can see those. Anyway, next slide. Okay, so here's a uh, lateral and anterior view of the brain, showing the uh, the ventricles. So you have the uh, left anterior horn and the right anterior horn there. And the posterior, the left posterior horn, and the right posterior horn of the lateral ventricle, and then the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle there, and that's on the left side, and the right side is, is there. Then you have the um, uh, third ventricle here, and showing that there's the interverticular frame in there, and this eye right here, you have the thalami, each thalamus in, in the brain, and then there's a little bridge going across, and so the so the if I can do that, so, so do my pen. So you have the thalami and the little bridge, and that bridge goes right through, right, right through that little hole right there. Then you have the cerebral aqueduct coming down, and it comes continues down here, and then you have the fourth ventricle here, and it continues down until you, oops, until you reach the spinal cord, and it becomes the central canal of the spinal cord down there. So here we are in this in this view. We have the um, anterior horn of lateral ventricles here. And going back, you can't see the posterior horn because that would be sticking back here. And then the inferior horn of the right lateral ventricle. And then here's the left lateral ventricle. There's an anterior horn sticking back there. And then the inferior horn would be here. Here's a thalamus. Here's another thalamus. And there's a bridge right between them. So here is your third ventricle there. And then here's your cerebral aqueduct. Oh, and you have um, here you have your interverticular frame and coming down to the third ventricle. Then you have cerebral aqueduct, and this expands out into the fourth ventricle. It's actually pretty wide, and then it continues down 
and, in, and becomes the uh, eventually becomes the um, central cranial spinal cord. But you see the fourth ventricle there is is wide in, in front of the cerebellum, but it looks but in the lateral view over here it looks like it's it looks like it's kind of small, but it's actually it's, it's it doesn't go back and front and back very far, but it goes side to side, uh, winds out quite a bit side to side. Okay, next slide. So, all right, we're going to talk about, so what, are, I talked about the lateral ventricles, I, didn't, I forgot to tell you what was in them. So inside these things is cerebrospinal fluid, uh, so CSF is in these things, so cere, cerebrospinal fluid, also abbreviated as CSF, so, okay, so, um, cerebro means cerebrum and spinal, sp spinal cord, so it's fluid that goes in and around the spinal cord and cerebrum. So what you have is um, inside the, the lateral ventricles and inside uh, um, you have these um, structures called a choroid plexus. And a plexus is a uh, place where some stuff comes together. Okay, it's the best way. To, so it's some, like blood vessels come together and they'll form a plexus, or nerves will come together and they'll form a plexus. It's refers, referred to as anastomosing. So things anastomose into a plexus. So something's come and join and they go back out again. So they come in, join, and branch back out again. So you have this jumble of blood vessels in this, uh, in this, uh, these, these, uh, these choroid plexuses, and in these choroid plexuses. They are. Uh, you have cerebrospinal fluid is being is uh, is coming from capillaries. It passes through ependymal cells. So we have capillaries and ependymal cells, which line. You remember the ependymal cells are some of the cells that are found in the in the uh, uh, central nervous system. Uh, some of the uh, neuroglial cells. So we have ependymal cells, and so so fluid from the capillaries flows through the ependymal cells. And it leaks out of those um, capillaries of, uh, of the choroid plexus, and the epidermal cells then uh, will modify that and secrete that cerebral, what is now cerebral spinal fluid, into the ventricles. So you get cerebral spinal fluid coming into the ventricles. So it goes out of the uh, capillaries that are that are in inside there, and then flows out into the ventricles. So you have this uh, this fluid that's made. And then the fluid, uh, you can see the arrows, and so it flows. It flows down the um, from you know, from the uh, lateral ventricles and the uh, third ventricle. It flows down the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, and then it goes continues on down through the middle of the spinal cord. It also goes out and around the outside of the spinal cord, and then flows back up. So it goes down here. It also goes out and around, and it goes and also goes back up. Around the brain, you follow these arrows and see it goes. It, so it flows around, and these and these little ependymal cells. You remember they have little cilia on them, so they're actually secreting this, and they actually move the cerebral spinal fluid. So it actually flows in and around. Uh, so it goes in, it comes all go down, and goes all the way back up, and then flows up around the brain, and it'll go out through those little villi, the arachnoid villi, into the superior sagittal sinus, and then that can get rid of the fluid off the brain. So you have these capillaries, they're leaking fluid through the epidermal cells, they're creating this fluid, it goes out into the ventricles, it goes down the spinal cord and around the brain, and if you kept leaking the fluid from the capillaries into the ventricles, eventually you get this pressure on the brain, this uh, hydrostatic pressure, pressure of the fluid and the water on the brain, and so, um, so in order to get rid of that, you send it out through these little microvilli into the superior sagittal sinus, which then drains the fluid out. So, so anyway, so it all flows. So all the fluid flows around the spinal cord and around the cerebrum as well. Okay, next slide. So, so the cerebral spinal fluid is constantly bathing the brain, and you make about 500 milliliters a day. Now, if you remember that uh, the, the Experiments we did, we talked about metric systems. So 500 milliliters would be uh, a, um, a beaker about 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 yay about yay big around and about about mm, probably like that that deep. So you know how, roughly how big I am, so you can kind of tell how big that is. So um, 
So it's made from the blood plasma, not the blood cells, but the plasma, which is the liquid that surrounds blood cells that are it's in the um, it's in your in your blood. Uh, leaks out of these specialized capillaries um, in the choroid plexus and passes through the epidermal cells into the ventricles. And the different ventricles all uh, all have a choroid plexus in them in them. So you can make it. You don't just make it in the top and it flows. You make it in the lateral and the, the third and fourth ventricle. So. And the uh, epidermal cells have cilia that move the, the cerebral spinal fluid in one direction and not that one direction. So it's a bad joke. It's usually about this point is really funny in class, but you know. Anyway, uh, choroid plexuses are on the are in the roof area of each of the four ventricles. So the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. Okay. All right. Um, next slide. The cerebral spinal fluid also flows in the central canal like a uh, showed on the diagram a little bit ago, and then back out in the subarachnoid space, and it's returned to the bloodstream by reabsorption through the arachnoid villi and the dural sinuses, and especially the, the superior sagittal, sagittal sinus. Okay, next slide. So here's the ventricles and the brain. So you have the lateral ventricles, the intraverticular foramen, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle, and the central canal and spinal cord. All right, uh, next slide. And this is just another slide showing the uh, ventricles and the flow of, of a CSF of cerebrospinal fluid um, in and around the brain and spinal cord. So, and you can see the fluid flows down uh, around the spinal cord, and you'll actually see uh, this uh, all this stuff um, later. I want to talk about, about the spinal cord next. You'll actually see this is the um, conus medullaris down here, and you can see this uh, cerebrospinal fluid flowing down and around and back up around it. And so the cerebral spinal fluid will flow all around, all the way around the brain, um, and then so it goes up and then through, through the subarachnoid space, then then out into the dural sinuses, like that. And so the dural sinus, remember that strip that's superior sagittal sinus, that strip right down uh, where the longitudinal fissure is, down down the middle of the between the two hemispheres of the brain. So you have that little gap there, so you can flow up into there and then then back down, and, and, and you can get rid of the excess fluid. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, the subarachnoid space this is just showing a, like a frontal section of the diagram of this, showing the lateral ventricle here, third ventricle, fourth ventricle, and showing the flow of fluid uh, going, going down through here and then out like that. So anyway, next slide. Okay, and one other thing I wanted to point out um, that follows along, it follows along with the, uh, the ventricles, so you have the uh, superior uh, or anterior horns, and then you have the, um, the posterior horn, and then the inferior horn of the, of the uh, lateral ventricles. And following along with those those in inferior horns sticking forward, uh, right right next to them is the hippocampus and amygdala down here. These two structures, and the hippocampus is important for learning, memory retrieval. Uh, so hippo hippocampus, uh, the loss of it is associated with uh, you know, loss of it is associated with loss of ability to remember things. The amygdala is your fear and pleasure center uh, is what's usually referred to emotional learning and memory is uh, so loss of that um, uh, or people who, who had damage to it often don't have don't have fear of things uh, they might, may also not experience pleasure as well uh, either so um, all right next slide so here's the the hippocampus uh, or the the brain and frontal section so there's a slice taken through the brain uh, where we were looking at before, so there was the hippocampus, uh, hippocampus, and amygdala was right there also, so amygdala. And so here's the hippocampus here in cross-section here, this little guy here, and here is the inferior horn of the lateral ventricles in there. So you can see how it follows along right underneath the uh, lateral horn. Well, the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. So, so inferior horn, oops, is there, and hippocampus right underneath it. Okay. Next slide.